Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slatter. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars rambling video. And for those of you who don't know, in my rambling series, I take a topic and just sort of talk about it. Not necessarily always with the same amount of research. That being said, today we will be covering a fairly lore heavy video, specifically how great the Y Wing is. So I think you guys will enjoy it either way. I'm recording this as a rambling video because tonight I have to record my Star Wars EU podcast with Corey from Corey Loses. We'll be covering Solo Command book 7 of the X-Wing trilogy, so if you're interested, keep an eye out for this channel. We'll be going live at about 8pm Eastern Time. Anyway, fans of the Y-Wing have always sort of been a minority. At the Battle of Yavin, X-Wing stole the show, while at the Battles of Endor and beyond, fans have attached themselves more to the heavy bombers like the B-Wing or even the K-Wing from Star Wars Legends. The Y-Wing is seen as sort of antiquated, as slow, not quite as powerful as other ships. However, while it is true that the B-Wing for example, unquestionably offers a lot more firepower, there's a reason why the Y-Wing was a phenomenal rebel fighter and irreplaceable within the rebel fleet. The Alliance was low on resources, it was low on fighters, it was low on real estate, and as I've discussed in prior videos, utilized a stateless strategy in conjunction with guerrilla warfare to strike at the Empire. They would launch hyperspace capable fighters, raiding targets before they could mount a defense, then leaving. In the Essential Guide to Warfare, we have the following quote. Dodonna believed hyperspace capable fighters could undermine the Empire's control of space and demonstrated this to the galaxy by winning high profile victories. To prove his point, Dodonna's Y Wings defeated Star Destroyer fleets at Tanab and Tawara and staged a series of successful raids against Imperial convoys and bases. Finding targets for starfighter raids became the top priority of Alliance intelligence. So, when considering the Y Wing, we have to remember that it existed and operated successfully within these confines. The y -wing was obviously needed because it offered more firepower and shielding than something like an X-Wing, making it much better for sort of heavy bombing duty. However, with that extra firepower and shielding came much less speed and maneuverability. However, the Y-Wing wasn't quite a lame duck, which is the first reason why it was a successful ship in the Rebel Alliance. Despite differing sources giving, well, differing numbers, B-Wings when compared to Y-Wings were essentially defenseless. And the Essential Guide to Warfare states explicitly that they were completely useless in a dogfight. So if you wanted to launch a B-Wing attack, practically that meant that you need to escort the fighters with X-Wings or A-Wings or something. That means that you need a lot more pilots and a lot more resources for a raid of the same value. Were Y-Wings good dogfighters? No, but they were certainly more capable than the B-Wing. And what's more, most Y-Wing variants had a turreted gunner, and the most common strategy for Y-Wing pilots was simply to just absorb damage and have their gunner fight off any attackers. General Psalm's Defender Y-Wings in the X-Wing series gives us a good example of how Y-Wings can be effective even just in anti-starfighter combat. That's not something available to B-Wings. So basically, a squad of Y-Wing bombers can drop out of hyperspace, it can attack a target with a variable payload, and still defend itself long enough to jump out should a defense be mounted. But that's only half of what made the fighter so attractive to the Rebel Alliance. The second, just generally, was cost. Unlike the X-Wing, which was produced primarily by and for the Rebel Alliance, Y-Wings had existed since before the Clone Wars and were extremely common throughout the galaxy. The Alliance was donated many of these fighters from independent groups, planetary governments, or just ex-Imperials, and also managed to steal some on their own. But it was more than just that. The B-Wing was an extraordinarily costly vessel, not only to purchase, but to maintain. The Y-Wing, on the other hand, was the exact opposite. Opposite. You could strip basically the entire shell off, keeping the vehicle functional, and in some cases even better than with the shell on, while also making maintenance, well, pretty simple. Another thing is that the bomber seriously lacks moving parts, it doesn't have complicated S-foils which needs to be maintained, it's essentially just a fuselage and a pair of engines. There's so many Y-Wings going around as I mentioned that if something breaks, well, just replace it with another part. It's almost like Corellian in the design simplicity. That being said, of course, as older starfighters, Y-Wings did need constant maintenance, but not to the degree of something like a B-Wing, and they were also probably more simple for the average pilot to jump in and just fly for the first time. But that's not all. Although those are the two main points I wanted to address, the Y-Wing was also really useful, just 
because of the weaponry it had. First off, many Y-Wing models were armed with an ion cannon, and the Essential Guide to Warfare specifically mentions that because of this, the Alliance heavily used them in commercial raiding. They could disable ships with the cannon, steal the contents, or even steal the ship itself. What's more, Y-Wings could have a variable payload and were well optimized for attacking targets on the ground, which definitely made it useful for Alliance raiding missions. Now, Y-Wings did fall out of popularity as the Alliance transitioned to the New Republic because they didn't so much need a ship that could defend itself, hit a target, and maybe even stay around to fight afterwards, and instead chose to go with ships like the B-Wing which almost always needed a fighter escort, but delivered a lot more in the way of weaponry. The New Republic was also able, of course, to manufacture their own fighters, could spend more on maintenance and pilot training, but that doesn't mean that the Y-Wing is a worse fighter, it just didn't fit the new naval doctrine quite as well. Certainly though, the Y-Wing still had uses, and we have to remember just how great of a bomber it was under the Rebel Alliance. Today's hashtag ask Ek quest of the day comes from Online God Gaming, who asks, why didn't the Emperor try to catch himself with the Force while he was falling down the Death Star in Return of the Jedi? And as the fan Flippantastics kind of says, I don't think the Emperor was that concerned. I've done a whole video about this in Legends, but I think even dying to Palpatine would sort of serve his grand plan in some respects. We know that the Sith liked being incognito and hiding. What better way is there to go into hiding than to be, well, dead? And I'm just theorizing, but in canon it seems like he let the New Republic rise, then degrade, and now he's ready to sort of assume power again with the galaxy basically being a fresh slate. I'd say that was sort of true in Legends as well. He did transfer his essence and built up a force in the galactic deep core, then struck back against the New Republic when they weren't ready or expecting it. That however is just my opinion. I'm curious to hear what you guys think, and if you think the Emperor purposely didn't catch himself while he was falling or just had no means to, which is also definitely a possibility. Anyway guys, that's all I have for today. Have a great day, and as always, may the Force be with you.